So we're going to title this message today, The Power of Purpose. The Power of Purpose. Understanding the value of purpose is like part two to this message. Okay? So today we're talking about understanding the power of purpose. Now, how many of you want to be blessed in your lifetime? Come on, let me see your hands. I think everybody in their right mind want to enjoy some prosperity in this life. It's never God's intention. It was never God's plan for one group of per people to have everything and everybody else suffer. Come on. This is why we have civil unrest in the world today, because people are tired. They're tired of being tired. They're tired of being sick and tired. And they want change. Come on. And I'm going to tell you something. Everything that happens in this world is motivated by spirits. Everything that happens in this world. There's only two types of spirit in the world. There's a spirit of God and there's a spirit of Satan. One of those spirits are motivating you to do whatever you do. Nobody's neutral. Hear me me out. Nobody's neutral. In other words, you hear people say, I'm doing me. No, you're not. Because if you look at what you're doing, what you're doing looks like something somebody else is doing. Think about that, because I hear that phrase all the time. I'm just doing me. No, you're not doing you, because when you look at what you're doing, you're doing the same thing other sinners are doing. So you're either doing what the devil is prompting you to do, or you're doing what God has called you to do. There is no middle ground. And you can look at everybody and tell, amen, who is prompting them to do what they do. Look what Paul says. Paul says, even when I try to do good, I think this is in Romans chapter seven. He says, even when I try to do the right thing, evil is always present. So how many know every time you try to do the right thing, how many know Satan is right there whispering in your ear, in your ear, tugging at your heart, trying to get you to do the wrong thing. And you have to make the decision whether you're going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. So everybody's going to be influenced. Everybody is influenced either by the spirit of God or the spirit of evil. Go to Romans chapter eight. It's going to be our foundational scripture. So nobody's neutral. We are in the middle of a spiritual battle. Humans, we are caught up in the midst of a spiritual battle. You know why? Because there was a battle going on before God created us. And the battle was between Lucifer and God. And when Lucifer got beside himself, everybody knows who Lucifer is, right? Lucifer, his name was Lucifer before he became the devil. And he was known as the light being. He was known as the choir leader. And the Bible talks about how beautiful he was. And his beauty and his wisdom went to his head. And he tried to ascend and knock God off his throne and say, I need to become God. And the Bible says God kicked him out of heaven so fast that it looked like a flash of lightning. And he was kicked down into the earth. And so the battle originally started with God and Satan. And then the earth became dark and flooded. And that's what you read in Genesis chapter one. See, the world was going on before Genesis one. So when you read in Genesis one, the world is not beautiful. The world is flooded. In the very beginning, in the the beginning, God created the heaven and earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth. Why did the earth start out like that? Because there was a battle here before the earth was created. And Lucifer, who is known as darkness, was kicked into the earth and caused the earth to become dark, void, and empty. God decided over a period of time, and we don't know how long it was that God decided when seeing the earth flooded, when he spoke and said, let there be light. You know, this is all in Genesis. And light came, and it was good, and it was the first day, etc. And then we go down to verse, uh, day number six, where God makes the man and brings him forth out of the earth. I got a question for you. Where's the devil at this time? He's still in the earth. All right. He was the one that caused the darkness and he's still in the planet. And so God makes everything over. All right. And he creates Adam and he creates the woman, takes the woman from the rib. You know the story. And Satan is in the earth the same time while God is doing all this. So when God put Adam in the garden and said, listen, these are the trees that you can eat freely from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch that one. Or else you will surely die. How many little story? I'm paraphrasing everything for you. All right. They go through the garden. Now, we don't know how long they've been in the garden before they ate from the tree. So how long did they get the chance to enjoy paradise before they messed up? We don't know because there was no time during that time. Time did not go into effect until after Adam and Eve sinned. Follow the story now. Follow the chronology. So they go through the garden. They eat from the tree that God told them not to eat from. And the Bible says they hid themselves behind the tree, the, the trees in the garden. 
Now, now, how many know sin make you do some stupid things? How are you going to hide from God hiding behind a tree? Maybe God can't see me if I hide behind this lectern. Sin make you do some foolish things. And so they're trying to hide behind the trees in the garden. Now listen to this. Now you got to go through the story. I'm not going to take you through all the verses, but all of this is in Genesis 1, 2, 3, chapter 1, 2, and 3. When God came in the garden looking for Adam, he says, Adam, where are you? What did Adam say? Adam said, I hid myself because I was naked. This is the part you got to see. Look what God said to Adam. Who told you you were naked? So the question that God proposed to Adam, Adam, who were you talking to? Somebody's out there influenced you because I didn't tell you you were naked. Who told you that? So I'm telling you in the earth, you're going to be either influenced by God or you're going to be influenced by Satan. Amen. And so God knew who told him. Amen. But God said to him, who told you you were naked because I didn't tell you. And there's a message in that for us as a believer. Be careful who you let speak into your ears because everybody is not qualified to speak into your life. Listen, this is why you have a shepherd. And this is why everybody needs to be in a church that God ordained for you to be in. Because there are some people who are not qualified to speak into your life. Amen. Amen. There are folks that are in church running around looking for prophecy. Come on, sir. And I'm going to tell you something. This prophecy stuff going to get you in trouble if you don't know how prophecy is supposed to work according to the Bible. You don't need folks to prophesy to you to tell you what to do with your life. If you want to know what to do with your life, you got 66 books. Yes, sir. And folks are not prophesying, they're prophesying. All right. Again, when prophecy go forward and somebody prophesies to you, don't you run with it if it sounds new and you're not sure. Prophecy is supposed to bring you confirmation to something God already told you. Prophecy is supposed to confirm what God has already told you. So don't let nobody tell you. So listen, God told me to tell you, you need to leave the state and go over here. Listen, if God didn't tell you to leave, you better stay right where you're at. God told me that you're supposed to marry so-and-so. Listen, if God didn't tell you to marry so-and-so, you better not get married. Because prophecy is supposed to confirm that something that God has already told you. Come on. But they got this prophecy thing all mixed up. Because the way folks are prophesying now doesn't line up with scripture to me. Come on. So God says to Adam, who told you that you were naked? You know, you can listen to some people and can tell who's been talking to them. You know, my minor in college was psychology. And in psychology, they teach you to be observant, to listen, to listen what people say. Because you can easily identify where people are when you let them do the talking. Listen, we, we got to do some messages again about dating and things like that. How do you date as a Christian, as a believer? Amen. One of the things you do, you do a lot of listening. And let the other person do all the talking. Because how many of you know when you meet somebody, they put on the best face for you. They put on all the best attributes for you. But how many of you know you only can fake but so much? Sooner or later, a bone going to drop out your mouth. So you let folks talk. Because Satan know what to say. To, to wean people, all right, to, to glean people in, all right? Everybody's in Romans. This is going to be our foundational scripture. And I'm going to give you some things to write down. We're talking about the power of purpose. Everybody's not qualified, amen, to speak a word <laughs> into your life. Ooh, I, I learned that stuff early. You know why? Because I've seen folks' life messed up because they heard some prophecy and went and did something, and their life is in shambles because God didn't tell them. Because they were looking for a word. I'm going to tell you something. When you go around looking for the word, the devil will give you a word. The okay. devil will set somebody up to give you a word. The Bible said he can disguise himself as the angel of light yes. and make you think the word is coming from God when it's not. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. All right. How many want to know God's voice? Everybody said, I know his voice and I will never be fooled again. Mm -hmm. All right. This is our foundation scripture, Romans chapter number eight. And we know this scripture, but we have to put this scripture in context. So we have to start at verse number 26, because many times we quote Romans 8, 28, but it's really supposed to be explained in context with verse number 26 and 27. So I'll go to 28 first. It says, and we know. Anytime you read, and we know in the Bible, that means what they get ready to say next, you need to know it. 
In other words, you need to commit it to memory. And we know what? I'm in verse 28. That all things work together for the good to them that what? Okay, so this is clear. All things don't work together for good for everybody. Because I hear sinners use this verse. I, I see sinners sometimes say it on these award shows when they give out these awards. You know, they don't talk about God all year round. But when it's time to give them, get the little award, oh, I thank God. Come on, won't you thank him with, with some of the things that you uh, portray on TV? We never hear you talk about God in none of your shows. But now when you're ready to get this award, I'll, oh, I give God thanks. And, and God is work. I even heard one brother, I'm not even going to call his name. God is working it together for my good. And I look at some of his movies all raunchy. I was like, come on, brother, he ain't working for you. Somebody told you a lie. You got the scripture all twisted. Because it said here in this verse, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. Question, how do you show God you love him? That's right, by keeping his commandments. That's the only way. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't call me Lord if you're not going to do what I tell you to do. I'm not your Lord, because if I was your Lord, whatever I tell you to do, you would do it. So the only way you can demonstrate love to God is by keeping his word. No other way. You can say, God, I love you. Oh, I love you. I love you with all my heart. But you don't obey the word. God said, you don't love me. The way you love me is by keeping my word. All things work together for good to them that keep God's word. So that makes it clear who he's talking to. This is not for sinners. Let's keep going. All right. It says for the good. Um, to them that love God, to them who are the call, according to what? His purpose. So one of the things you need to understand about the power of purpose, you were set here for God's purpose. None of us was brought here for ourselves. But somebody came out with a song and said, it's your thing. You can do whatever you want to do. No, you cannot. It's not your thing. You were not put here for you. According to this verse, you were put here for God's purpose. Didn't we just read that? To them who are the call, according to His purpose. So all of us was placed here by God for God. Are we clear on that? All right. So again, we take this verse and we kind of take it out of context. So let's go back to verse number 26 and then read straight through. It says, likewise, I'm still in Romans, but I'm at verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. All right. That word infirmity there means uh, weakness, inadequacies. Doesn't mean sickness. All right. Because as a child of God, we don't walk in sickness. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity, right? The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now we're going to be healed. We are healed. Even if you feel symptoms in your body, you're still healed because Jesus paid the price for you. So when it says here, likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, it's not saying the Spirit helped us with our sickness because we're not supposed to have sickness in our body. When it comes, that's an attack from the enemy, and we rebuke it, and we say we are the healed. Likewise, the spirit also helped our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. So when we get down in prayer, sometimes we don't know what to pray for. So the Holy Ghost starts praying through you so you can pray the perfect will of God. This is what verse 27 says. It says, and he that searches the heart, know it what is the mind of the spirit. Who searches the heart? God, God searched the heart. Man, look at the outward appearance, but God searches the heart. It says, he that searches the heart know what is in the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession. The spirit of God in you makes intercession for the saints. How? According to the will of God, according to the purpose of God. This is why everybody needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost because how many of you know you can't pray the perfect will of God for your life if you don't have the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost helps you to pray. It intercedes on your behalf according to the will of God. And when you pray and the Holy Ghost starts praying for you, because the Holy Ghost pray for whatever you missed in your prayer. And when the Holy Ghost finished praying with, through you, then you know all things are working together for your good. Why? Because you didn't miss anything in your prayer. Whatever you miss, the Holy Ghost covered for you. That's why we go now into verse 28. That's what 28 is really talking about. It's talking about the power of prayer, that when you pray with your understanding and let the Holy Ghost pray through you in tongues, once you get up from your prayers, you know all things are working. Because whatever you forgot to pray for, the Holy Ghost prayed it for you in tongues. Can you see it? So when you get up, you say, and we know that all things are working together for the good. For them that love God and to them who are the call according to his purpose. All right, let me give you some things to write down. I'm give you some nuggets. I started out by saying everybody wants some kind of prosperity in their lives. Everybody want to enjoy some success. Write this down. Before you ask for prosperity, you need to ask God for purpose. 
That's number one. Before you ask for prosperity, the first thing you need to ask God for is what is my assignment? Why? Because there's a whole lot of folks prospering at the wrong thing. There's a lot of folks that are successful at the wrong thing. How many know you could be successful at the wrong job? You could be successful doing the wrong things. You know, there's some folks who get degrees and they spend thousands of dollars, amen, to go to school. And then they work for a period of time and then they realize, you know what? This is not what I want to do. So you were successful at what you're doing, but it was no gratification. You didn't feel complete doing what you were doing. So you were successful, but you were successful at the wrong thing. So it's possible to be successful at the wrong thing. So before you ask for prosperity, you need to ask God, what's my purpose? Before I ask for a whole bunch of money, God, what am I here for so I know what to do with the money when it comes? You have that? So before you ask for prosperity, ask God what for what? For purpose. Number two, before you ask for a relationship, ask for direction. Before you ask God to put you in a relationship, ask God, where is where am I supposed to be going? Give me some direction. Give me purpose and give me direction for my life. Because guess what? If God bless you with a relationship and you don't know where you're going, you and the person that you're connected with, both of y'all are going to end up in the ditch because the blind can't lead the blind. So if you don't have any direction for your life and you bring somebody into your life, you're both going to end up in the ditch, according to the scripture. So before asking God for a relationship, make sure you ask for what was the first thing? Purpose. And the second thing is direction. Where am I going? Because if you don't know where you're going and somebody hook up with you, both of you going someplace and you don't know where you're going. You're an accident waiting to happen. Listen to me. God is not going to send you somebody until you know where you're going. Anybody want companionship? Anybody want to meet in their lives? Anybody want to be married? Come on. God is not going to send you anyone unless you know where you are going. You need to understand your purpose and you need to know where you're going. How many of you know Adam knew his purpose? What was his purpose? God said, listen, Adam, subdue. Take care of the garden. Name everything in the garden. Did Adam do that? Yeah, he dominated, he subdued, he started naming the animals. God looked down and said, man, this man is so busy, he needs some help. Listen, he understood his purpose and he knew what direction he needed to go in. And when he knew that, notice what the Bible says. God looked down in the garden and said, it was not good for that man to be alone. Adam didn't say that. Adam didn't say, you know what? I'm lonely down here. Adam didn't even know he was alone. Why? He was busy. And how many of you know you won't even experience being lonely if you get busy doing what God called you to do? So Adam didn't even know he was alone. God looked down and said, it's not good for this kind of man to be alone. What kind of man? A working man. Come on. If you find a man and he's not working, it is good for that man to be alone. Amen. <laughs> because Tyler said you could do bad all by yourself. You don't need nobody to help you to do bad. So if you find somebody, I don't care how much you in love and I don't care what his eyes look like and when he bat his eyes, it just said butterfly through your spine. I don't care if he's not working. And first of all, even before work, the first thing God gave Adam was his presence. The first thing God, as a matter of fact, I'm jumping ahead, but just kind of put this in your note. The first thing God gave the man was his presence. God put him in paradise. Follow me now. When you read through the Bible and you read through Genesis, how many of you know paradise? The Bible referred to the Garden of Eden as paradise. Now, how many of you know the Garden of Eden is on the map where the Garden of Eden is actually where it's at, where it's located? But you know what? There is no place on the map called paradise. All right. There's a place on the map. Matter of fact, I can't remember exactly. It's near the Euphrates River. And I think that's I'm trying to remember where I saw that on the map, like over there in like Arabia or in the Arab nation in that area. I'm trying to remember. I'm going to look on the map to see. But it's near Euphrates because the Bible said the Euphrates River ran through the garden. So the place where the garden is, the actual place that still exists. But when you go to that place, it's not a paradise. You know why? Because the paradise represents the presence of God. When Adam messed up, the present left. The garden was still there, but God's presence wasn't there. So the first thing God gave the man was his presence. So when you meet somebody, and if they're not living in the presence of the Lord, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. 
And the church said, Amen. so the first thing, they got to be in God's presence. The second thing, they got to be working. All right. They got to be working. And if they're working and they got direction as to where they're going with their life, that's a man that you may want to connect with. How many of us here wish we had had this information years ago? Come on, to be honest. Lord, have mercy. Mm. All right, I got some more to add to that. All right, let's keep going here. Mm. So I said before asking for a relationship, ask for direction. Why? Because when people come into your life, the right people will add to your life. Make this, make this note. When people come into your life, the right people will add to your life. The wrong people will subtract from your life. I said earlier, everybody is influenced by one or the other spirit, either God or Satan, right? Watch this now. Y'all got that last statement? When a person is added to your life, all right, or when a person comes into your life, they either add to your life, the wrong person subtracts from your life. This is so important. Write this too down. Write this right, right next to it. If God didn't send them, they are not for you. Let me say that again. Regardless of who it is, it doesn't have to be like a uh, relationship that you're going into to get married. It could be a business relationship. If somebody comes into your life and God did not send them, you need not to connect with that person. You need to get in no kind of relationship with that person. Why? Because everybody's influenced either by God or the devil. So if God didn't send them, who sent them? That's right. Talk back to me. So when people come into your life, the right people come, they add to your life. The wrong people come in your life, they do what? Subtract. So when they come into your life, two entities sent them, either God or the devil. Now, with that being said, some of us that's in relationship, you can go back and look at your relationship now and say, wait a minute, who sent this person that I'm with? Who sent me this person? Because if God sent them, they will add to my life. If God didn't send them, they are taking away from my life and they are holding me back. Selah. Listen, this is good information that the church, everybody should have before you're connected with anyone. So think about every relationship you're in. Are they adding to you? Or are they holding you back? Or are they keeping you from going forward? If they're holding you back and keeping you from going forward, maybe that relationship has to be severed. Anybody tired of staying in the same spot? Wait, there's a word called, I think it's insanity. That when, let me see, there's a definition for insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. You, you're insane. If you keep doing the same thing over and over the same way, you're not going to get a different result. You're doing the same thing. If you want a different result, you got to change what you're doing. Hmm. This, is, this is a word to evaluate all relationships. Business relationships, any kind of relationship, friendship. Is this friend adding to my life? Is this friend stifling me from going forward? Always discouraging me. You can't do that. You're too old. You're too young. You're too fat. You're too skinny. Always got a, a, something to say negative. You don't need nobody like that in your life because they're either stopping you or holding you back. Come on. Wow. I heard somebody say something the other day. I kind of like this. He said, uh, what are the kind of people that you want in your circle? He said, the kind of people that you want is when you walk into a room and they're happy to see you, you want those people in your circle. Man, that's powerful. When you walk into a room and somebody, they're glad to see you, that's the kind of people you want in your circle. Anybody like that feeling when you walk in somewhere and folks are just happy to see you? Man, I've been looking for you. God bless you. And it's genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the kind of people you want in your circle. Because there's some folks that'll look at you, but they ain't happy to see you. They're just as jealous as they can be. Because they're looking at what you have and wondering why they don't have it. And the reason why you don't have it is because you jealous me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, I, those of you that have been around here for a while, we had a, you know, sometimes people come from other country, you know, and they learn the English language. Sometimes they leave some of the words out when they say certain things. So we had a brother that he would come and testify. Say, listen, God bless me and don't you jealous me. <laughs> but we understood what he meant. Don't be jealous of me. All right? 
And so there are folks, they're not glad to see you because they're jealous of what you have. Anybody ever heard this phrase? You are a product of the environment that you're in. You know, whoever you hang out with, that's who you become. And let me tell you something. If you're a good person, you can't hang out with bad folks. So I'm going to change them. Mm -mm. If anything, they're going to change you. How do you know, Pastor? Because if you took a barrel of apples and you took one good apple and placed it in a barrel with a bunch of bad arrows, bad apples, how many know those bad apples are, or the good apple not going to turn those bad apples good? It will never happen, not in a million years. And it don't even have to be a barrel. Next time you go shopping, get you a bag of fruits and get you a little basket. And when the apples go bad, keep one good apple, buy another apple that's good and put it in with those bad apples. Because that's like a good saint going with bad folks. And what's going to happen? The bad apples going to turn the good one bad. It never works the other way. You can never put a good apple in a thing with a bunch of bad apples and come back and all the apples are good. It'll never happen. What is it telling you? Good folks, your inheritance. Jesus says, the Bible says, once you get saved and sanctified, your inheritance is among those who are saved and sanctified. So that means once you get born again, you're supposed to be around people who are born again. Because they will convert you before you convert them. Come on. So my prayer has been, and again, I don't put my business out unless God tells me to do certain things. I said, God, listen, I found out since I've been in ministry, it takes money to run ministry. So I said, God, you got to show me how, especially this scripture, God keep prompting my spirit in, in, in Luke, I forgot the chapter, but in Luke, where he said the children of this world are wiser than the children of light in their generation. That means sinners, they know how to invest better than believers. Right? How many remember when God came to Solomon? He said, Solomon, not now David, his father, who was king, had died. Now Solomon had to take over the throne. So God comes to him in a dream and says, Solomon, what you want me to do for you? What you need me to do? Solomon didn't ask for per uh, Solomon didn't ask for prosperity because prosperity is the second thing. He said, "Listen, I need wisdom. I need you to instruct me. Tell me how I'm supposed to lead your people. I need the wisdom to be a good leader. Show me my purpose. Show me why you gave me this position." Look what God says to him. God says, "Solomon, because you didn't ask me for prosperity, I'm gonna give you that anyway." So Solomon was asking for wisdom to know what his purpose is. And when you read about the life of Solomon, Solomon was richer than his dad. And David was rich. Oh, listen, the next time we come, I remember doing this in a message. I'm gonna break down to you and show you the money that was coming into Solomon. The Bible talks about it. It talked about the money that was coming into Solomon. I was it the queen from Ethiopia. That's right, the first the queen from Ethiopia came and to see about the wisdom of Solomon. You got to read the story. They heard about Solomon's wisdom. And this queen had a whole lot of money. She said, listen, I want to go and see what they're saying about Solomon. Is it true? Now, if you know anything about kingdoms, in a kingdom, one king will always try to outdo the other. So that's why when she came, she came with an entourage of camels and gold and silver to bless Solomon with. So read that story, because every time in a kingdom, one king always want to outdo another king. That's why in the world that we're in, Jesus is king, but Satan is pretending to be king. And he's trying to outdo God. Two kingdoms always trying to outdo each other. Can you see it? And so she came with all this money to bless Solomon. Watch what Solomon did. You got to read the story now. I think the story might be in Chronicles. All right. She comes with, now she's rich and she brings all this money to Solomon and said, listen, I heard about your wisdom. And Solomon started talking and, they, and she said, man, they didn't tell me the half of your wisdom. But look what Solomon did. Solomon blessed her with more than what she gave him. And the Bible says she lost her breath. That means she fainted. Wait a minute. She came with all this money and Solomon gave her more money than what she came with. She fainted because she'd never seen it before. How I many know God's ready to put us in that place? Listen to me. All of this has to do with promised land. When we talk about promised land, that we're all headed to the promised land. Are you hearing me? We are still on our way to the promised land. Just because I don't preach it every Sunday don't mean we're not on our way. Listen, we are exactly where we need to be to get to the promised land. So I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what's happening in your life. Stay on course because we are smack dab in the middle where God wants us to be. Are you hearing me? I don't care what's going on in your life. Satan is trying to derail you from the plan of God. 
You stay focused. I don't care if things are falling behind. Your God is a provider. And you keep saying what your father says. Because Satan will bring things. I tell you, things are either coming from God or Satan. And Satan will send things to try to derail you. But you got to say, my name is Victory. You hear the songs that we're singing around here? All these songs are designed to build you up so you can stay on course. So you say this to yourself in my closing. I'm, in, I'm smack dab in the middle of where I need to be in God's will. Of where I need to be in God's will. Say it again. Say, I'm smack dab in the middle of where I need to be in God's will. Now, there's two kinds of will. There's the perfect will and there's the permissive will. Permissive, permit. The will that God permits. There's a perfect will and there's a will that God permits. In other words, God will permit whatever you permit. If you allow certain, if you allow the devil to beat you up and you don't rebuke the devil, then God got to allow it. That's called permissive. He has to permit whatever you permit. The devil beat you up and you don't bind him. God ain't going to bind him for you. Because the Bible says in Matthew 18, whatever you bind on earth, God will bind in heaven. It doesn't say whatever God bind in heaven, then you bind it on earth. Uh-uh. So if the devil smack you upside your head, you don't say nothing. God ain't going to say nothing. But if you say, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, then heaven says, Satan, you heard what she said. Get back in the name of Jesus. Come on. So we got to make sure we start speaking life out of here. All right, so I think I gave you three, three things, right? Let me just make sure I want to give you something, one more thing before I close out. I gave you, before you ask for prosperity, you get purpose. Before you ask for a relationship, you ask for a direction. I talk about people who are added to your life. Either they're there to help you go to the next level, to add to your life, or they're ready to take away. And then one of the things I said to, and I'll close with this. When somebody's in your life, they're either sent by God or the devil. I'm going to show you two scriptures real quick. Anytime God brings somebody in your life, the Bible says God sent them. So either God going to send folks into your life or the devil going to send folks in your life. You need to know who's sending the person. How do you know? Can we know? Anybody would like to know? Man, this person's in my life. Okay, what, why this person here? Okay, let me give you two scriptures and I'm done. St. John chapter one. Let's go there real quick. People are either sent by God or sent by who? The devil. Is anybody sent by nobody? No, nope. because there's nobody in between. Everybody's influenced either by God or by Satan. So next time somebody come in your life, who sent this person? So let's end with this. John, the gospel of St. John, chapter number one. Let me get there and I'll end with this. I got some more good stuff, but my time is up. Did you get anything out of what I shared today? All right, let me go here real quick. Let's see if I wrote this verse properly. Uh, I'll, I'll read a couple of verses. I like to explain things in context. I'm in the Gospel of St. John. We know that this one says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, God. And without him, God was not anything made that was made. In him, God was life. And this life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. This is the version of this. Look at verse number six. There was a man sent. What does it say? From who? By God, whose name was? Why did John come? No, no. no, no, no based on the verse that we just read. Yeah, it says earlier what we continue to read. But based on this verse, let's read that verse again. Six, verse number six. There was a man. There was a man sent from God whose name was. So why did John come on the scene? Because God sent him. He didn't just show up and say, I'm John the Baptist, repent. No, he came there because God sent. Who did God send him to? God sent him to the Israelites because the gospel was to the Jews first, then to the Greek, and then to as many that were received. So John didn't just come on his own preaching to the Jewish nation. He was sent to the Jews by God. Let's keep reading. Read the next verse. The same, on verse 7, the same came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might what? So I'm just giving you this one verse. Next time we come, I'm going to give you a few more verses that show you. And when we go to Kings, I'm going to show you that God sent Elijah to the widow woman. God sent John the Baptist to the Israelite. God sent Jesus to his people. Matter of fact, make a note of this. The same chapter. Go down to verse number 11. Oh, let's, let's, I'm going I'm to end this way. I'm going to keep reading until I get down to verse number 11. I'm at verse number 8. He was not in the world, but was sent to bear witness. I'm sorry, he was not, he was not the light. 
but was sent to bear witness of the light. So it's talking about John. John saying, listen, I came to bear witness of the light, but I'm not the light. Who's the light of the world at that time? Jesus was the light of the world. And John saying, listen, I'm not that light, but I'm here to tell you that the light is coming. He's the forerunner, right? Let's keep going. Verse number nine. That was the true light, which lightened every man that cometh into the world. So when you come into the world, guess what? You won't know what you're here to do unless you get enlightened by the light. Did you get that? Every man that comes into the world, you're not going to know what you're here to do unless you're enlightened by the light. Watch this verse. The verse one more time. He was the true light. Talking about Jesus, which lightened every man that cometh into the world. So if you don't have the light of Jesus on the inside of you, you're not going to know why you're here. Let's keep going. I'm going to end at verse number 11. Verse number 10 says, he was in the world and the world was made by him. Talking about Jesus. Jesus was in the world. He made the whole planet. The world was made by him. And the world, the people in the world did what? Knew him not. Isn't that something? Here's God on the planet. He made the planet. Folks looking at God and don't even know who he is. That's why I tell you all the time, folks, thanks to God, don't you get upset when people don't know who you are. When they disrespect you and say things in front of you, that's because they don't know who you are. Jesus was in the world. He made the world, and the world didn't even know who he was. So if they did that to Jesus, guess what? They're going to do it to you too. All right, and I'm going to end with this one. Look at verse number 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Wait a minute. Who did Jesus come to? To everybody? Nope. He was sent by God to go to his own people. Oh, boy. So he came unto his own, and his own knew him not. 